The title of today's sermon is The Bible is Truer Than Our Own Experience. We, play, uh, we, we uh, follow these words. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible is true. Peter says that the Bible is more sure than what he, James, and John saw on the mountain of transfiguration with their own eyes. He says that he himself has more confidence in the prophetic word in the Bible than he has in his own eyes. Now, how can he say this? How can Peter say that he relies more on the Bible than what he does, than, than, than what his own eyes have seen? Now, every one of us can't avoid the protest of our culture and our country against the Bible. Whether it's Mark Twain mocking it as the first comedian in, comedian in the 19th century, even though Mark Twain is pretty awesome, or Thomas Jefferson, who is also, in my opinion, kind of awesome, he himself edited the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so as to exclude all miracles. He thought the resurrection and all things that he had done were myths. So the third president of the United States of America thought that the miracles of Jesus were cleverly devised myths. Well, today we're going to look at three proofs of the Bible, why we can be so certain that the Bible has no errors, and what this has to do then with the transfiguration. First, miracles... Wonders, signs, these attest to the truth of the Bible. Second, the prophecies of the Old Testament are fulfilled in the New Testament. And finally, thirdly, the Holy Spirit testifies to our own hearts through faith that what we read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest in the Bible is true. The first proof of the divine authority of the Bible is that the prophets and apostles who wrote the Old and New Testaments confirm their preaching with miracles. Now, a miracle is something that happens contrary to nature. It's something that you marvel at. When Moses was afraid that the people would not believe him when God sent him to lead them out of Israel, God gave him miracles to show to Israel and Pharaoh that he was a prophet. He gave him three. The first was that he threw his staff down on the ground and if you'll remember, it turned into a snake. The second miracle was that he put his hand into his cloak, and when he pulled it out, it was white with leprosy. And then when he put it back in and pulled it out, it would be clean again. And finally, he could take water from the Nile and put it on the ground, and it would become blood. And then with many other signs and wonders, Moses showed his divine authority to preach, and he wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which is called the Law. So his, his, his preaching was confirmed by miracles. And the reason why is God got so angry with Israel for grumbling in the wilderness was because they had seen these miracles and they had seen greater ones than these. And Jesus also did many miracles to prove that he was a prophet and that his words were true. In John 10, he tells the Jews that don't believe in him, if I am not doing the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. In other words, look at what I'm doing. Doesn't that tell you that what I'm saying is true? And when Jesus sent out his apostles to preach the gospel, we read in Mark 16 that they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord, the Lord Jesus, worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. <coughs> Confirm the message. That word confirmed is actually related to the word more sure in the epistle lesson for today. 
The preaching of the apostles was confirmed at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit led them to speak in different languages and to prophesy and to heal the sick and even to raise the dead. And God confirmed the prophets and apostles' testimony about Christ with miracles and signs, just as the author of the Hebrews in chapter 2 says that our salvation was attested to us by those who heard. Attested means they witnessed it, they bore witness. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by his gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And so the preaching and the writings of the prophets and apostles were attested to and confirmed by miracles, something supernatural that people saw with their own eyes. Now the second proof of the Bible is that it, that the Bible is the only source of divine revelation from God to us is that the prophecies in the Bible come true. God said to the people of Israel through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18, after he had just promised that Christ would come, in the meantime, how do they know that a prophet is speaking the truth? He gives a very simple criterion. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You don't need to be afraid of him. Now, God prophesied many things in the Old Testament, and they came true. He prophesied the end of kingdoms. He prophesied specific events about specific battles and people, and his prophecies came true, and they were, were, were recorded by witnesses of the prophecies. Most especially, his prophecies concerning Christ came true. And Jesus himself points to this out to the Jews of his day, to whom the scriptures had been committed. We find in John 5, You search the scriptures, Jesus says, because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. That is, the Old Testament talks about Jesus. From beginning to end, the Bible is about Jesus. His birth, birthplace, lineage, miracles, sufferings, death, resurrection, ascension to heaven, his session at the right hand of the Father, all of these were prophesied in the Old Testament and recorded by witnesses in the New Testament. Both the prophecies and the fulfillments of the prophecies were confirmed by miracles which pointed to the divine authority of the Bible. Now when I say divine authority, I mean the authority of God. Divine means having to do with God. And we say every Sunday that God the Holy Spirit spoke by the prophets. So we just heard, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The words of the Holy Spirit were spoken by men like Moses and Samuel, David and Solomon, Isaiah, Daniel and Ezra and many more. He gave them the words to speak. Now this doesn't mean they didn't know what they were saying. You shouldn't think about, it's called mechanical inspiration where the evangelist Matthew is sitting there minding his own business and all of a sudden, and then he starts just going and writing the words of the Bible. No, he, he knew what he was writing. But the Holy Spirit moved them so that what they spoke was the word of God, not their own private interpretation. He gave them the words to speak. This means that the words are entirely accurate. God spoke them and God doesn't lie as men do. And so we can rely on what he says. The Bible will not deceive you. And we come to rely on the words of scriptures, especially when we hear them preach to us, when we read them, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. And there is no teaching that can bring you to faith in Jesus that can reveal God to you as he loves you except the teaching drawn from the Holy Bible. And this is because the Holy Spirit led the apostles into, the, into all truth, as Jesus had promised. They recorded for us everything that we need to believe in Christ and to live according to God's will. Put it simply, if the Bible has errors, God has errors. If the Bible makes mistakes, God makes. If the Bible deceives, then God deceives. In fact, since the time that churches began asserting that the Bible has errors over 100 years ago, people have begun to believe that God does make mistakes, that he does have errors, and that he does deceive us. Look around you, the workplace, at school. What do people believe? And why is this? It's because they have no faith in God. How could they have faith in God when they don't know where God speaks to them? They can't rely on the Bible when they don't believe it's true. But the third proof of the veracity, third proof of the truth of the Bible, is one that we all must experience personally. The Holy Spirit testifies to our hearts that his word is true with the words of the scriptures. In John 7, Jesus says, If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know 
whether the teaching is from God. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God. Such is the power of the scriptures that they pierce into our hearts and change them. God calls the word of God a sword of the spirit in Paul's epistle. He says in the Hebrews, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word goes into our inmost being. It tears down all objections that the world raises to the truth of the Bible, which are bad objections anyway, and shows us that what God is saying is true. I'm going to go through a few of these objections, and it's not an exhaustive list, but maybe this might help you. Sometimes you will hear, but the Bible's been translated so many times, how can it be the same now as it was thousands of years ago? Maybe you've heard this. But this is a common thought, but it's made in complete ignorance. Any English Bible that you have in your home, and that you read on uh, every, every evening, I hope, has only been translated once. Once from the original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. No, we don't have the original manuscripts on which the Bible was written, but we have more manuscripts of the Bible than of any other ancient manuscripts available. Scribes copied them meticulously, and the differences between the manuscripts were minuscule. I'm, we had a joke out in the narthex before church because a visitor had put the wrong date for his visit. And so we said, oh, we should cross that out and change it. And I said, no, don't change it. Just write the correct date above it. Because that's the way the Hebrew scribes would do things. They would never, ever change the text. They would translate it exactly as it was. And if they thought there was an error, they would put it in a, on the side, but they would never, ever change it. Scribes copied them meticulously, and the differences between the manuscripts are really minuscule. Now, the Old Testament scriptures have been confirmed time and again by archaeological finds. The New Testament scriptures have more manuscripts than any other writer in ancient history so that we can say more certainly that Jesus said something than that Cicero or Caesar or Aristotle or Plato said something. The Bible you have and that you read in English is an accurate translation of the original languages. Now, I might prefer one translation to another, but the fact is it comes directly from the original Greek or the original Aramaic or the original Hebrew. Another objection people would say is you can't take the Bible literally. Do you take the Bible literally? You can't take it literally. Well, this objection comes from ignorance of literature in general, which is why it's very important to make sure your children have good English teachers. Now, of course, there are parts of literature that you don't take literally. So Jesus calls Herod a fox. He uses a metaphor. You can't say that Jesus is lying. Herod was a fox, but not the furry animal that English people used to hunt. They don't hunt him anymore. Did you know that? The end of an era. We still believe the metaphor that Herod is a fox, even if we don't read it literally. The metaphor is true. What Matthew wrote about Jesus saying that is exactly true. And some people object that the Bible contradicts itself. And one of the ways that they say the Bible contradicts itself is by comparing the laws of the Old Testament with the abrogation or dissolution of the laws in the New Testament. So they'll say, but you can eat pork now. And the Bible says not to eat pork. So, the Old Testament law is speaking about homosexuality and other deviant sexual behavior apply no more than dietary restrictions on shellfish and pork. But this is also an argument from ignorance. And really, it has to do with the biblical illiteracy of our society today. Nobody made this argument before because they knew it wasn't true. I've seen it on TV like three or four times. Christ fulfilled the law as the New Testament speaks. That's what the whole New Testament is about. And he did away with any government of Israel that was not his spiritual kingdom. So now this is the kingdom of God through that is hidden. This, the kingdom of God does not come by observation. And then he told Peter in Acts, in a dream, he said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. When Peter saw all these supposedly unclean animals. And Peter said, No way, I'm not going to do that. And he said, Are you arguing with me? Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And so Peter the apostle got to enjoy bacon for the first time in his life. And it must have been an amazing experience. The truth of scripture remains hidden from so many people, even though Peter calls it a bright light shining in a dark place. But that's just it. People think they can rely on their reason or their feelings and their understanding to know what God's truth is. But our hearts and our minds are dark places. 
What have you got hiding in there? All sorts of sins, misunderstanding your neighbor, misunderstanding God, all sorts of sins, most of which you're probably not even aware. There are too many to count. And there's the cause of the darkness. It's not because evolution is true. It's not. People stop, start believing in evolution because they stop believing in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, as the Bible revealed him. People stop believing the Bible because they don't read it, because they don't look to it for help when they are helpless. They don't want to admit that they're helpless. Instead, they look to the world and its treasures and pleasures and solutions for their day-to-day -day problems. And the world gives them their light. And before you know it, the Bible seems irrelevant to them and dark, while the world seems the only, like there's the only, that the only light they have is what the world gives them. And they don't want to get told that the way they're living is wrong, and so they ignore the Bible, or they reinterpret it according to their own whims. They trust the world that contradicts itself every second of the day over the Bible, which never contradicts itself. And they just assert the Bible contradicts itself, the Bible contradicts itself, with most of them never having read it. And the great tragedy is that the Bible wasn't written to beat up on them. It wasn't written just to judge them and to show them how awful they were. The Bible wasn't really merely written to show them their sin, although it does. The Apostle John tells us why the Bible was written in these beautiful words. He says, But these things are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You do well to take heed to the scriptures, to pay attention to them. You do well to listen to God's voice to you in the Bible. Why? Because only the Bible reveals to you the glory that is yours now through faith in Christ. Now this hymn, it bugged me, and I, I didn't know that I was going to preach today. This sermon, well, it came out of yesterday, and luckily I had been complaining about this hymn. It's hymn uh, 413. And so I went and looked at the original Latin, because I'm a nerd. And verse 3, it, now it says... What glory, the, the, verse 3, 413, what glory shall be theirs above who joy in God with perfect love? But in the original Latin, it says, what glory is the believers, not in the future, but that the glory is yours now, and then who enjoy God faithfully. So what glory is those who believe, belongs to those who believe who now enjoy God faithfully. You have this glory now, even though you don't see it. That's why Peter says that the Bible is a light shining in a dark place. You have it. The world doesn't see it. It doesn't believe it exists. That's why, that's why Jesus said, don't tell anybody the vision until after the resurrection, because the resurrection proves your future glory that you will actually see and feel. Christ showed his glory to the three men so that we could imagine just a little bit of the glory that will be ours, but also to show them that the glory is ours now. Moses was there to represent the law, the first five books of the Bible. Elijah was there to represent the prophets, the rest of the Old Testament. Peter, James, and John were there to represent the New Testament. We receive God's glory in the Holy Scriptures. They contain Christ, whose glory is hidden from our sight, but it shines in our hearts when we believe the gospel that the Bible reveals, when we believe that God is reconciled to us through the death of his Son. The words of the Bible are the words of God, our maker, and they do what they say, just as he said, let there be light, and there was light. So he says, your sins are forgiven, and they are forgiven. They do what they say. And they're despised by this world, ignored, mocked, even banned, and always twisted to suit the whims of false prophets, but they are still true. They are still given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God did not speak from their own interpretation, but as they were moved by this gracious light from heaven, the Holy Spirit. And just as Christ's glory was hidden on the cross so that all you could see was darkness for three hours as he was suffering, so also the light of Scripture is seen to the unbelie is, 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 isn't seen to the unbelieving eye while we hold it in our hearts. And just as Christ is the light who shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not comprehend it, so the Scriptures shine into the world, and it is so sad when people don't believe it in favor of the false teachings of this world. But it is so beautiful when people do grasp it. Paul Gerhardt writes, Oh, the joy beyond expressing when by faith we grasp this blessing. There is no greater joy than coming to meet our Savior as the scriptures present him to us. There is nothing more certain that a heart can lay hold of 
than the promise of eternal life through faith in our Savior Jesus. There is no life more worth living than the life that is guided by the prophetic and apostolic word. The life of faith in Christ, knowing God as our, as our merciful Father, and loving our neighbor as the Bible teaches us to. And that is why we read it. Brothers and sisters, read it. Read it, please, I beg you. The world is taking over us, and the remnant will be preserved only by the Bible, only by those who read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it. If you do not teach the Bible to your children, what else can you say? But if you do pay attention to this prophetic word, the Bible, doing this, knowing that this is the truth from God, then you can be certain that you're not relying on the fickle and changing opinions of our dying culture, but that you are able to stand on Christ, the solid rock of your salvation. It is knowing that when God tells me my sins are forgiven, he is not lying because the scriptures describe to me who my God is and in doing so they give me my maker not so far away from me, not judging me for everything that I have done, but drawing near to me in flesh and blood like mine, almighty and ruling over everything, but humble to serve me in my need, gentle and lowly of heart, giving me the rest my soul so needs. Now we don't see this glory yet, but we know we already have it. It is in our hearts, whether we feel it or not, because Jesus gives it to us. The Bible tells us so. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. O oh God, and renew our right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And you're unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Uh, as, you, as you leave, uh, Mark Trauga and maybe somebody else will be handing out our time and talents 
sheet. We got a few uh, people to turn them in, but we're trying again to get more people to turn them in. So please consider turning in time and talents. We need volunteers in the church. In our prayers today, we give thanksgiving for a successful surgery for Jim Perry, for his eye. And we also give thanks for Shirley Sprecher's successful surgery on her back. She's feeling much better and still recovering. And of course, we continue to keep Dan Lindner in our prayers as he undergoes cancer treatments. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. <coughs> Almighty and eternal God, worthy to be held in reverence by all people everywhere, we give you humble and sincere thanks for the innumerable blessings that you have bestowed on us without any merit or worthiness on our part. We praise you especially for preserving for us your saving word and the holy sacraments. Grant and preserve to your holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and provide faithful pastors to preach your word with power. Help all who hear the word rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith to the people of Israel and to all unbelievers. In mercy, bring to repentance the enemies of your church and grant them amendment of life. Protect and defend your church in all tribulation and danger. Strengthen us and fellow Christians to set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ. And help us to fight the good fight of faith, that in the end we may receive the salvation of our souls. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Bestow your grace on all nations of the earth. Bless especially our country, its inhabitants, and all who are in authority, and those who fight to preserve our liberties. Let your glory dwell in our land, that mercy and truth, righteousness and peace may abound in all places. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Graciously defend us from all calamity by fire and water from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine, and from every other evil. Protect and prosper all who labor in their rightful callings. Be especially with all fathers and mothers. Grant that they might teach their children the word of God, and let all useful arts flourish among us. Be the God and Father of the lonely and the forsaken, the helper of the sick and the needy. We especially commend into your care Jim and Shirley and Dan, and the comforter of the distressed and those who sorrow. Lord, in your mercy, accept, we implore you, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before you as our humble service. Lord, in your mercy, grant your Holy Spirit to those who come to the Lord's table this day, that they may receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ in sincere repentance and firm faith and to their abundant blessing. Lord, in your mercy, as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, Help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work you have given us to do while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. And when the last hour comes, support us by your power and receive us into your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts and lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who at his transfiguration revealed his glory to his disciples, that they might be strengthened to proclaim his cross and resurrection, and with all the faithful look forward to the glory of life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of Sabaoth, of thy glory, O 
Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. <coughs> Give us this day. as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament, in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ the Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This true body and precious blood of our Lord strengthen you and keep you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat. The true body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. The body of Christ given for you. Take and drink. This is the true blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink the true blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. 
take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. The blood of Christ shed for you. This true body and precious blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen you and keep you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink, this is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and drink, this is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This true body and precious blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen you and keep you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace.